Ability scores are arguably the most essential part of any character in Baldur's Gate. They affect literally every aspect of how the game is played. But would it be possible to beat Baldur's Gate 3 without any? Let us find out. Just some quick disclaimers before we begin. Some of you might be wondering about Atrophy. I was planning on doing this with one in every stat. However, upon reducing them to zero, I noticed that the game would allow it without killing me. The difference between zero in every stat and one is literally nothing. So if you're upset by this, just pretend they are set to one. Also, if you're wondering what the legendary potion I have in my inventory is, it's just a mod I use to reduce my stats to zero. Feel free to check it out in the description. Anyways, let us begin. Let's just quickly go through what having no stats will actually mean for this run. Obviously we will have minus 5 to every check, that's the obvious part. What one might think of a bit less is that with no strength I have no carrying capacity. For some reason the game still gives us a generous 40 base capacity before we become overloaded. But for now this does not help us at all as with no strength we cannot pick anything up, like anything at all. With this in mind you might just think that going with spells is clearly the way to go here, but with zero in intelligence and wisdom we will at most be able to use one spell from any of these classes. With zero dexterity we get minus 5 to our AC, meaning that dodging attacks will pretty much become impossible. It also makes it so that our initiation rolls with a minus 5 every combat, leaving us to act last in every single encounter except for the very first one. But worst of all, with zero constitution, whilst the game, surprisingly enough, doesn't outright kill us, it still leaves us with an HP pool between 1 and 7 depending on what class we start as. Right away it became apparent that my choice of druid was not the best as I couldn't even get past the first imps. Even when I managed to take out two with my spell slots, I still had to face the last one in a one versus one with nothing but my main hand attack, which deals negative four to three damage by the way. We are so weak that supposedly our attacks heal the enemies. And so after dying over and over, it was time to rethink everything. For my origin, I decided to go, very importantly, with Dwergar, and the only class that could save me was, as you might expect, Cleric. This is because Cleric starts with Sanctuary, a spell that prevents us from getting attacked by anything apart from AoE attacks. For my domain, as probably the first person to ever do this, I chose the Trickery domain, specifically because it gives us Disguise Self. Returning to the terrifying imps once more, I could now Sanctuary myself and run right past them, all the way up this ledge until I merged combat with the Intellect Devourer. That helped me clean up this mess. At the helm I cast Sanctuary again, and by dashing, entering turn base mode and then dashing again, I had enough movement speed when I got in to escape in just two turns. Arriving on the beach, I could now send items back to camp, which even though I still cannot directly interact with them, is still useful as supplies from there can still be used for something like long resting. Sneaking past the intellect devourers, I killed the mind player with three attacks and of course left Gale to die. This gave me level 2 and let me multiclass over to Druid, using my one available spell for Enhanced Leap. Like a true warrior, I sat in this corner hiding, just waiting for Sedlor to kill all the goblins for me. Before running straight over to this tiefling here, as I wanted to test something. By speaking to him, he gives us a normal battle axe. Importantly, since this is a quest reward, it gets put straight into my inventory without any need to pick it up. And here is where what I fear the most happened. Having no strength means that equipping any items, even if they are already in our inventory, is not possible. This means that I will be stuck with the minus 4 to 1 damage mace, a shitty 2 AC shield, and a 13 AC chest plate for the rest of this playthrough. No rings, no amulet, no helmet, no gloves, nothing. I made sure to collect Scratch as he will be mandatory way later in Act 2, and as always, using the disguise self for my trickery domain, transformed into a drow, talking my way all the way over to the goblin camp. With level 3, I put another level into druid and could now pick the Circle of the Moon subclass, granting me access to the wild shape bear. And also, importantly for my Dwergar race, got a one-time use per long rest of enlarge. This one, contrary to the spell version, does not actually require concentration and so can be comboed with a bunch of other things. Transforming into a bear, even though it doesn't improve our stats at all, still grants us an extra 30 HP, an actually usable HP pool. Still needing level 4 before any real fighting could be done, I scared off a hag with my monstrous 3 HP and convinced a gift patrol that I totally was 
one of them. Now at level 4 it was showtime. I multiclassed again over to Wizard, which gave me access to one more level 1 spell, Feather Falling. With Feather Falling, Enhanced Leap, and the Enlarge granted from Dwergar, we could now transform into a bear with a massive 5005 kilogram weight. Damage has successfully been acquired. Now with a level of Wizard, I could also go back and get Shovel to join me. Letting Gut escort me away, she gets the London treatment, and Minthara does not fare any better. Wait, she's she's dead though, isn't she? <laughs> this is actually some looty tooth shit right here. <laughs> good fight, good fight. Ragsling will be a bit more tricky to deal with, but by climbing up here and using Shovel to surprise everyone, we can crush him from up above. And then using Sanctuary, just run away. And while I'm busy escaping, if you're enjoying this video, why not hit the subscribe button? It's completely free and it would really help me out. Down in the Underdark, I make sure to transform into a bear before heading down these steps. As if I just walk down normally, Raphael would appear. But since he hates animals or something, he decides to just not show up. Down in the colony, I went straight over to Glot and convinced him to join my cause before walking straight back to where you're supposed to encounter Bullet for the first time. By placing Shovel in a position where he would join the fight without getting crushed by the bullet, I was able to disengage myself from the fight before it even began and sneaked all the way up next to Falar Aluv. From here I just had to reuse all the buffs to easily crush the bullet. With bullet now at my side, the rest of the Underdark really stood no chance at all. And so, with the first couple of Dwergar dead, I headed over to the Grimforge. Since I couldn't just tackle any fight in this run, I did want a huge chunk of XP rewarded by Grim. But of course, I had no real means of actually collecting either the Mithril Ore or a Splint Mold. And so, had to slowly carry it down the forge using Shovel and a Mage Hand that somehow managed to throw the mold on itself mid-air. Brilliant stuff, really. Anyways, I could now activate the Grim encounter and trigger the fight from up above. Using Shovel to make him vulnerable, I easily deployed the classic Owl Bear from the top rope strategy. Sadly, the Adamantine armor was still unobtainable, but at least it had gotten me all the way to level 5. With it, it was time for a quick respec from Wizard over to Sorcerer. By picking the Draconic Bloodline subclass, I could now get Armor of Agathus, a great source of temporary hit points that would remain even when I transformed over to a bear. And since you don't have to pick between the Sorcerer spells either, it would actually let me use more than one spell at a time, letting me fit in something like Magic Missiles. And low as the base damage might be, it's actual damage we can use in fights without needing to drop a whole bear on top of our enemies to kill them. At level 5, we also get Dwergar's second extremely overpowered race ability. It's invisibility that's usable an infinite amount of times and that lasts forever. At this point, I noticed that I still did not have the artifact, so it was finally time to acknowledge Shadowheart and borrow it from her. With level 5, I thought I'd have a go at killing Ethel, since she guards an item that we can actually use the despite us not being able to equip anything. Using my newly acquired invisibility, I skipped past all her masked servants and jumped right down to her. I freed Marina, and using the sea invisibility granted by Volo's eye, I was able to reveal Ethel. Despite being revealed, Ethel is still ambushing, and even though she's visible now, she won't react at all to my minor illusion. So I simply hit her with shovel, triggering the fight to remove her ambush status, also making her summon her four servants down here to help her. Somehow, shovel managed to live through being surprised and could simply go invisible to disengage. Even though I could get Ethel to come to the corner I wanted now, it was still too much of a hassle to keep her there, so instead I just gave Shovel Sanctuary and walked her in once more. And after a few turns of waiting, Ethel walked over to this spot right here, exactly where I wanted her. Now all I had to do was climb right back up and well... The item I wanted is Second Marriage. It's created from Bitter Divorce and allows me to summon Connor whenever we like for a single action point and is also usable any number of times straight from my inventory. Of course, the real hard part here is actually collecting it. Since I myself cannot move any items, I can't put them in any boxes and my summons, whilst being able to move the items, cannot open boxes. So I didn't even have any way of sending it away to camp. Since we cannot pick it up but can still use it 
abilities from the floor, I got the idea that maybe if I resurrected someone, it would put it straight into my inventory. It was worth a shot. And perfectly for me, there are four willing subjects just waiting in the other room. This genius idea of mine did sadly not work as Ethel's subjects aren't resurrectable. However, I did discover another way more important thing here. For some reason, when interacting specifically with a corpse and dragging an item that is on the floor, it puts a weird phantom version of the item inside of the corpse's inventory, while still keeping the actual item on the ground outside. This is a huge deal, as normally items on the floor cannot be sent back to camp, but items in any container can. So with this unintentional feature, I could now send Bitter Divorce away to camp. To get it from camp, I simply had to put it in a container, drag the container over to Withers, put the item into Withers inventory, and then succeed the 20 check to collect it. Only one last thing to do in Act 1 now. Back in the Grimforge, behind this hidden door, there's a gnome called Philomene, who carries some very potent explosives that I really need. I tried to get him using the brute force way, which uh, didn't go great. Oh shit, I clicked the wrong option. <laughs> After correctly persuading her to not kill herself, first time of course, she hands us a small version of the bomb, but by quickly entering turn-based mode after she picks up the bigger explosive, we can slay her and collect the bigger bomb as well, using the wither's trick once more to get it into our inventory. Now with Act 1 mostly done, I made sure to respec over to any class that had silence and also grabbed reckless attack for good measure. Why? Well, there is a reason we've been avoiding Raphael all this time. Since we still have not met him, the game will forcefully put us in camp upon entering the mountain pass, with Raphael just waiting there to speak to us. Raphael, as you probably know, is the enemy in the game with the highest HP pool, so unsurprisingly he is worth a lot of experience. If there would be some way for us to knock him out, we would get all this. But there is a problem. Upon hitting him or missing him, dialogue will simply start right away. This of course is why we needed silence. It, as it states, prevents any spells from being cast by entities inside, but there is also another more important line in the silence condition. Creatures cannot speak. So while inside the aura, we are free to hit Raphael as much as we like without him being able to start a conversation with us. Here's the second problem. I do no damage and have a mere 10% chance to hit Raphael, even with advantage. This is why I wanted Connor in the first place. He has a decent 35% chance to hit Raphael, still not great, but miles ahead of what I myself had, and so it was time to deal 865 damage using a zombie that only lasts for 10 turns. No! Are you kidding? Silence can run out? I'm gonna have to do all this shit again. I'm having fun right now. I love doing challenge runs. I swear to god, man, this is just any percent route to getting carpal tunnel. After, let's just say, a bit too long, in an ever-expanding blood pool, Connor finally landed the finishing blow on Raphael, after which I could swoop in with a non-lethal attack toggled on and collect my 1400 XP bounty. Onwards to Act 2 we go. Approaching the caravan, I used my Jedi mind powers to lure Karnas over. We need his lantern and so need to kill him, but with his recent buffs in honor mode, he is very scary, so I'd like to cheese him as well if possible. To do this, I made sure to stop right here, just before the cutscene with the waiting harpers could trigger and summoned in a corner that I gave sanctuary. After doing so, I hit a goblin with shovel, causing everyone but Cornus to get surprised. By running away with Connor down this hill, Cornus would follow him, letting me jump up on this house and do the same thing as always. Now I just needed to wait for the Harpers and the Absolutists to fight each other and for a lone survivor to come out from the fight before finishing them as well. While collecting the lantern, I made sure to grab a few other goodies I had just laying in my camp chest. Right after, I went back to Dareth in the colony and bought two invisibility potions from her. Using the fact that I could resummon Connor an infinite amount of times, I cheesed the encounter just outside Moonrise and headed over to kill one of the forms. The highest point in this room is nowhere near high enough to actually kill kill him, so instead, using Shovel once more, I lured Malice and his sisters all the way over, past a very beat up Raphael, to this cliff ledge. Time to tackle the Gauntlet of Shar. 
In order to complete the gauntlet, we only need one of the four Umbral Gems. But because we can't pick anything up, collecting one from one of the challenge rooms is just not possible. Which only leaves the one next to Yurgir. He perfectly KOs himself, and very timely, there just so happens to be a Displacer Beast corpse right next to the gem. So I'm able to use the weird phantom item glitch to successfully collect the gem. We also just so happens to get level 6 here for our very first level 2 spells. The perfect time for Nock to be available. Entering Night Song's prison, we get followed by some crazed necromancer who talks some nonsense. And so now, since we didn't deal with him before, I have no other choice than to deal with Balthasar before being able to free the Night Song. First, I tried using the Mage Ham to push him off, but apparently he has mastered the art of cheating and just teleports up again. I'm not quite out of options yet though. By jumping back up to this point here and clicking in just the right spot, Big Mama Bear claims yet another victim. With Night Song freed, it is now time to take on Moonrise. I skip right past Sorel and make sure to cast Sanctuary on myself before approaching Kethrick on the roof. Shovel gets a fireball to the face and Dame gets obliterated, but due to Sanctuary, I myself am safe and on my own turn can cast Invisibility to position myself however I like. After a couple of turns, I get the perfect position. Kethrick standing right next to a ready to blow skeletal egg. I place down the explosive we got from Philomene and run away as far as I possibly could. And after the Necromites have taken their turns, the egg hatches, blowing up both the bombs for some massive damage to Kethrick. This lets me trigger his cutscene with a few magic missiles. And thanks to the bear form and the armor of Agathis, I'm able to tank a fireball to the face and successfully escape unharmed. Time for the final preparations before taking on Merkel. First of all, we need some way to deal with Kethrick again. You used to easily be able to crush him from this small height here. However, after a lot of trying, it seems as though they have made it way harder to do so. I still felt like this was the best way to deal with him, so collecting a few boxes would be needed. And thankfully, there are quite a few just waiting for us right next to the Displacer Beast corpse back in the Gauntlet of Shar. After collecting the boxes and stuffing them down my pants, it is now time to enter the zone of no return. Using my one and only fly potion, I was able to fly up on this ledge despite being overloaded and while carefully avoiding Kethrix and the Necromine's line of sight, stacked all the boxes on top of each other. I gave Scratch enhanced leap and feather falling and used a mage hand to throw an invis potion at him. This is so that he, all by himself, can free Night Song whenever I need it. I dropped the second invis potion for myself and using my one and only Missy Step Scroll, get back on top of the boxes. This lets the second mage hand toss the potion at me while simultaneously triggering the encounter. Here, initiative rolls are really important. We need to make sure that Dame rolls less initiative than the intellect of ours and make sure that they move away from her before we free her with Scratch. All of this to make sure that she moves to the middle platform during the first turn without getting distracted by any intellect of ours. The turn comes to me and using the boxes I just barely have enough height to take out Kethrick. Now with Merkel here, I still need some way to deal with him and of course of course, I prepared another set of items just for this time. Two stacks of smoke powder bombs. These can easily be acquired from Quartermaster Tally by just continuously partial resting to reset her stock of items. Since I am still invisible, I am free to walk away from Merkel without triggering any opportunity attacks and drop a stack of bombs next to me. Merkel gets his turn and uses it to attack Dame, which is why we needed her to be in the middle, as otherwise he would just have used Call of the Damned, killing my Mage Hand and with it any chance we have of victory. How is Mage Hand gonna win this for us exactly? Well, for some reason, if you attempt to throw a bomb that has been dropped as a stack on the floor, it will not just throw one of the bombs, but the entire stack. And so, in a single move, my mage hand is able to do half of Merkel's health. The turn comes back to me, and I jump up right next to him and drop the second stack of bombs. I barely managed to survive an opportunity attack, only due to the combined HP of both Agathus and my bear form, successfully finishing off Merkel with some magic missiles aimed straight at the second bomb pile. Time to leave for Act 3. Straight away, we encounter another problematic fight. Upon resting, the gift from inside the artifact attack, but very worryingly, it counts as us taking a long rest before the fighting starts. This means that any shield we try to put up, or transformation we do prior to it, will be undone by the time the fight actually starts, even if the gift's initiative rolls perfect for us, meaning that two of them cannot reach us, the third one will always use Fist 
of unbroken air, guaranteeing that we die. So it's time to respec and put 4 levels into any class. The feat we want in particular is tough. It gives us 2 health per level and works despite us having 0 constitution. And since we are still only level 6, it does not grant us a lot of health, but at least enough to survive the air punch and cast Sanctuary on myself. At this point, I thought that I was in the clear. I had survived the initial attack and with no other way to attack me, I just gunned it for the exit. But then, upon ending my turn, I just got a game over. It turns out that what I was talking about all the way back in the intro had happened. Her voice reduces your intelligence, wisdom, and charisma by 2 every time it procs. And since we're already at 0, it gives me the atrophy condition, killing me instantly. Time to once again visit Withers and grab Misty Step. After a few more failed attempts, I finally managed to survive the hit and was successfully able to escape. The fight with the gifts next to the Emperor was nothing too hard, and just a couple of thunder waves did the trick. We have now officially made it into Act 3. Walking straight past the guard patrol and into Worm's Rock, we get a vision of Orin taunting us. So just to spite her, I decide to do something I normally never do, which is siding with Gortash. Time to head over to the sewers and take care of Orin. She shows up and tries to talk with me, but not feeling in the mood, I decide to just have a look at my artifact instead. I respec just to grab the normal and large reduce spell and talk to this voiceless NPC that stands right outside the Undercity ruins. He sometimes sells cloud giant fingers needed in order to create elixir of cloud giant strength. This very powerful potion sets the strength of whoever drinks it to 27 until long rest. Of course, I myself am not allowed to use it, since that would ruin the point of this whole run, but someone else will be able to. And so, after a few partial rests, I successfully collected enough resources to make both the potion alongside an invis pot. Opening the door using this corpse, I skip the invisible encounter, and since I'm the Dark Urge, my butler is just waiting here, opening the door into the ball temple. I summon in my mage hand, and my goal now is to somehow feed it the potions I have in my inventory. I am too weak to throw it myself but there is still a trick we can use to let it drink them. By selecting it and then hitting tab, our inventory opens. This makes it so if we attempt to drink any potions now, the mage hand will do so instead. And having now fed it both the potions, it has 27 strength and an invisibility that lasts for 10 turns. And so after casting enlarge on it, I simply have to walk it on over to Orin and throw her right into the abyss. before easily escaping with invisibility of my own. The reason we needed the 27 strength potion is that the normal elixir of hill giant strength is just not quite enough to let the mage hand throw her off. Now with Orin dead, we just need to collect the dagger with the nether stone. But to do so, I need to use the corpse trick again. However, there is none nearby. I did find one down the stairs in this room, but for some reason, upon trying to throw the dagger down the stairs, it just disappears into the floor, so that is not an option. Thankfully, Orin's victim is still laying on the altar, and since I killed her without starting the duel, the game has not counted it as me saving her yet. And so upon leaving and doing a long rest, after returning she lies dead on the altar. A bit sad for her, but it's great for us since this lets me put the dagger into the corpse and then move it to camp, successfully letting me pickpocket it from Withers. With both the necessary nether stones now in our possessions, I headed over to Sorcerer Sundries to collect the two scrolls we still needed for the final fight. Since I am only level 7, a Globe of Invulnerability scroll cannot actually spawn to buy in a vendor's inventory. It can, however, spawn randomly in a chest. So after ignoring Loroakan and heading straight down into his tower, I found one in this display case right here. Continuing onwards down into the vaults, I used Knock on this display case and collected the Artistry of War scroll. This is a strictly stronger version of magic missiles and way stronger than anything we currently can use with our single level 4 spell slot. Collecting the scroll from Withers, it's time to regroup with Gortash and head to the Morphic Pool. Gortash tries to snatch the Netherstones from us and use them to command the brain, which doesn't go great for him, but at least we have all the three Netherstones now. The Emperor offers us to transform into a fully fleshed Illithid, and this is exactly what will let us beat the game. As a newly transformed Illithid, we have upgraded versions of 
of all of the Elithid powers. Like for example, a 25 HP temporary shield instead of the normal 10 HP one. But most importantly, it gives us an upgraded version of Perilous Stakes. Apart from just healing the entity affected by it, it also gives all damage they deal 15 guaranteed extra psychic damage. I approach the room where our allies are supposed to wait for us, but instead it's just Witherstare telling me that I'm a lonely loser. Thanks bro, I already knew that, no need to tell me. As always, I skipped past all the fights up to the netherbrain using invisibility. Before entering, I made sure to dash twice with the Emperor using turn-based mode, and dash once with myself. This lets him make it all the way over to the crown and stun two of the Mind Flayers turn one. Because I also got to dash, I can join him, and using the fact that being a full Elithid gives me the old Mind Sanctuary buff each round, I can cast Globe of Invulnerability from this corner here and start channeling Karsus' Compulsion. The only Mind Flayer that actually casts Mind Blast uses it on the Emperor, missing me, and I get to open the portal and head straight into the final fight with the Brain. Buffing myself with Perilous Stakes, I enter with the Emperor and attack the Brain. This causes its reaction to trigger, slowing him, but since I myself am standing on the topmost platform, the Brain Quakes doesn't actually reach us. With my two actions available, I first use the Artistry of War Scroll, dealing some massive damage as every projectile triggers the extra 15 damage from Perilous Stakes, before doing the same thing with Magic Missiles. Of course, the Brain gets immediately to Psychic and Force damage to turn after, so all we have to do now is refresh Perilous Stakes and wait it out, successfully managing to bring the brain down with another magic missile, proving that it is in fact possible to beat all of Baldur's Gate 3 with zero in every stat. Thank you so much for watching, click on another video here if you want to, I appreciate all of you and I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye. Hello.